There is a copper cylinder in the liquid helium, so mounted that we can turn it about a vertical axis. In order to turn it smoothly and with as little vibration as possible, we make the cylinder into the armature of a simple induction motor energized from outside the doer. The four horizontal coils you see provide the torque which turns the cylinder. The liquid helium is electrically non-conducting. The coils exert no torque on it directly. Yet, as we turn on our motor, the liquid layer bounding the cylinder is dragged along by it. The boundary layer, in turn, drags on the next layer, and so on outward. Finally, a circulation shows up in the helium due to its own viscosity, and the wooden paddle wheel is turned along. What we have just seen occurred in helium-1, the normal phase, at 4.2 degrees Kelvin. That is to say, this demonstration is consistent with our results for helium-1 by capillary flow. Helium-1 is viscous. Here you see the liquid cooled down and passing into the superfluid phase, helium-2. Let's turn on the motor. The paddle wheel starts again. What does this mean? First of all, let me emphasize that, like helium-1, helium-2 is also non-conducting in the electrical sense. In other words, the circulation in the experiment can only have been caused through viscous drag. So we conclude from the rotating cylinder observations that helium-2 is viscous, and from the method of capillary flow, that it has zero viscosity. Our experimentation has come up with a paradox. No normal classical liquid is known to behave so inconsistently in capillary flow on the one hand and in bulk flow on the other. This state of affairs forces us to think of helium-2, the superfluid, not as a single, but as a dual liquid. It appears as if helium-2 had two separate and yet interpenetrating component liquids. We shall call one component normal. It is this component which we hold responsible for the appearance of viscosity below the lambda point in the rotating cylinder experiment. The normal component, as the name suggests, behaves like a normal liquid and therefore has viscosity. It is the one which the cylinder drags along as it turns but the normal component cannot flow through the narrow channels of the ceramic disk because of its viscosity. The second component has zero viscosity and it's called the superfluid component. We think that it does not participate at all in the rotating cylinder experiment below the lambda point. It stays at rest. On the other hand, it can flow through channels of one micron diameter with the greatest of ease, encountering no resistance whatever because it has no viscosity. As we'll see later, this flow is not impeded even when the capillary diameters are made far smaller than one micron. This thought construction is called the two-fluid model for liquid helium-2. Whether it is correct or not depends on further tests comparing the theory based on this model with experimental results. We now go on to another phenomenon, the fountain effect. What you see here is a tube which narrows down and then opens into a bulb. A small piece of cotton is stuffed into the cons constriction between the tube and the bulb. And the bulb has been tightly packed with one of the finest powders available, jeweler's rouge. A second wad of cotton keeps the powder in the bulb. This powder presents extremely fine capillary channels. Their average diameter is a small fraction of one micron. This device has been placed in the doer. The liquid helium is below the lambda point. We submerge the bulb, and then we'll send a beam of light from this lamp to a point near the top. You will see the light beam when the lamp is turned on. 
It focuses some heat in the form of infrared radiation on the point in question. The temperature will rise above the temperature of the rest of the apparatus. Let us turn it on. Liquid helium flows through the hole in the bottom of the bulb, through the fine powder, and rises above the level of liquid helium outside. The height to which it will go depends on the temperature increase produced by the lamp focused on the bulb. We can very well ask, where does the mechanical energy come from that does the work necessary to pump the liquid above the ambient level? Before we attempt to discuss this question, there are two other facts that should be noted. The first is by now obvious. The upward flow through the bulb must clearly be a superflow. Only the superfluid component of helium-2 could get through. The second fact is more significant. Let me explain it this way. The superfluid flows spontaneously from A to B, from a cooler to a warmer place. Point A is in the cold liquid, but B is being heated with infrared rays. The second law of thermodynamics positively says that heat cannot of itself flow from a point of lower to a point of higher temperature. What does this mean to us here, knowing as we do that the superfluid is flowing from a colder to a warmer spot? Simply this, it carries no heat, no thermal energy. Any internal energy it may still possess is no longer thermally available. To say it precisely, it has zero entropy. We have discovered another remarkable property of helium-2. Its superfluid component not only is friction-free, it also contains no heat. The heat energy contained in helium-2 as a whole resides, all of it, in the normal component. We may, of course, add heat to the superfluid component, as we are doing when it passes the spot heated by the lamp. But in doing so, we are converting it into the normal component.